Good afternoon. Thank you for joining Demographics, Trends, and Assessment of the LGBTQ Population. My name is Todd Conady, and I am the Director of Clinical Services with Pride Institute. Today, our session is sponsored by the Foundation's Recovery Network. Just some things regarding the question and answer session. You can submit a question on the bottom left of your screen at any point during the presentation. All questions will be answered during the last 10 minutes of the program. Resources. You can find a PDF of the presentation and additional resources under the headshot image located on the left of your screen. Help. For assistance, please email, email Melissa Pangaro at mpangaro at naccme.com. Regarding uh, NADAC credit information, to receive credit, you must watch the program all the way through the Q&A section at the end of the presentation. Do not leave the console. Please continue to stay on the platform and you will be automatically redirected to an evaluation landing page. If this is your first time attending a webinar in 2019, you will need to create an NACCME account when you are first directed to the landing page. For all subsequent webinars you attend, you will already have an account and will just need to log in. After completion of the evaluation, you will be able to download or print your certificate. NADAC credit is only offered for the live broadcast. Again, good afternoon and thank you for joining this webinar. My name again is Todd Conady. I'm the Director of Clinical Services with Pride Institute. Uh, before you is a picture of Pride Institute located in Eden Prairie, Minnesota during the beautiful summer months. Uh, Pride Institute was founded in 1986 in direct relation to a response to the AIDS epidemic crisis going on at that time. Pride was founded as a safe space for gay and bisexual men at that time to seek treatment for substance use disorders. Since that time, Pride has gone through many transitions to currently be in an, an exclusive LGBTQ facility that offers residential partial hospitalization and intensive outpatient services. Here is a picture of the Residential Treatment Center, Center Backyard Facility. This is our intensive day partial hospitalization with lodging house. And we have two locations for intensive outpatient programming in Minneapolis, Minnesota and Rochester, Minnesota. Again, Pride Institute is and only serves the LGBTQ community. Our goals and objectives for today we're going to review LGBTQ plus terminology. We're going to identify the substance use disorders and mental health needs of the LGBTQ community. We're going to understand why specific and exclusive treatment for the LGBTQ population is important and the issues that need to be addressed. We're going to look at the trends and demographics within the LGBTQ community. This will be done at a level of Pride Institute, also a state level for the state of Minnesota. And on the national level, uh, we are going to review the SAMHSA National Survey on Drug Use and Health uh, from 2015. Lastly, in our presentation, we are going to review and discuss the need for LGBTQ affirming psychiatric evaluation and the impact of sexual and gender minority stress on the substance use and mental health issues of the LGBTQ community. Just to disclose, I have no financial interest or relationship. So we're going to start today, and this first slide is not to pathologize the LGBTQ community. And I do want to note that I will be using the term queer to designate the LGBTQ community, so I will use that interchangeably, LGBTQ and queer. I provide these statistics, which comes from the National Transgender Discrimination Survey Report on Health and Healthcare from 2010, to identify how pertinent and needed services are specifically to the LGBTQ community. As you can see from the slide, we have individuals that are still denied health care or refused treatment by their doctors, individuals that have been harassed in health care settings, people that have been attacked in their doctor's office, people that have to educate their provider on competent LGBTQ care. Ninety percent of individuals have been harassed or threatened at work. 
our LGBTQ individuals, particularly our trans-identified and queer-identified individuals, live in extreme poverty. 60% to 70% of experienced physical or sexual harassment. A majority have been rejected by their families and not contacted by them. 70% experienced homelessness and 78% have identified physical or sexual harassment in educational institutions. Additionally, we see four times the rate of HIV infection uh, as compared to the general population, particularly trans-identified individuals, females of color, have even higher rates. Suicide attempts are 41% higher than the general population. 10% report higher rates of smoking than the general population. And 43% report using substances to cope with oppression and discrimination. We will be speaking regarding the minority stress model as it pertains to sexual and gender minority. In 2015, the American Psychological Association came out with new guidelines and standards of care for working not only with the LGB population, but for the trans and queer identified population. And for all of us, we need to understand that gender is a non-binary construct that allows for a range of gender identities and that oftentimes a gender identity may not align or match what the individual's assigned uh, sex at birth is. I've heard it stated that as many individuals as there are in the world, that is the number of gender identities that exist in the world. Also, individuals understand that gender identity and sexual orientation are distinct but interrelated constructs. Gender identity pertains to that internal or psychological sense of self, as sexual orientation includes facets of sexual attraction, sexual identity, and sexual behaviors. Number three, individuals are aware how their biases and attitudes may affect the relationship they have in working with uh, gender nonconforming individuals. And it is important that therapists, professionals, and other individuals do the work that needs to be done to address biases. So our next section will actually be a review of LGBTQ plus terminology. In providing education on this issue, I never like to make the assumption that everyone has the basic understanding. And so for our um, work today, a lesbian is someone who experiences a need for warmth, affection, or love from another woman or identified woman. This may or may not include sexual contact. For gay, this particularly pertains to men, the need for warmth, affection, or love from another man, and may or may not include sexual contact. Bisexual is a person who needs warmth, affection, and love by people that identify as male or female. Sometimes this includes sexual contact. Pansexual is an individual that regardless of a person's gender identity or expression, they may feel a need for warmth, affection, or love from that individual. Again, this may or may not include sexual contact. Transgender. Trans is the Latin prefix for across, and this really is an umbrella term used to encompass all people that transgress societal dictate of what male and femaleness uh, is is constructed to be. Individuals that identify as transgender, um, typically their internal psychological sense of self does not match or is not congruent with their sex assigned at birth. Cisgender, cis is the Latin prefix for on the same side. A cisgender individual is a person whose assigned sex at birth matches their internal or psychological sense of self. We also have two-spirit, and this is really used by First Nation Native Americans to identify individuals that may possess both masculine and feminine spirits, or may possess neither, or may be someone that identifies as gender fluid. As you see, number three, according to the American Psychological Association, individuals will seek to understand how a gender identity intersects with other cultural identities. 
this truly speaks to the the idea of intersectionality and not just looking at gender and sexual orientation but looking at other facets and components of the individual which includes abilities or ableism ageism socioeconomic status race ethnicity and really to provide competent care means to take all of these intersectionalities into account when working with the individual. Queer. Queer, many years ago, was a pejorative term used to disparage members of the LGBTQ community, particularly with millennials and the Generation Z generation. Queer has come back into favor and is a term that is used quite often. And it really is used to identify those individuals who identify on the sexual orientation or gender identity spectrum. Please note that for some particularly older generations, this word still has some negative connotation. So please proceed with caution when using the word queer. Questioning. So this can be any individual that is either questioning their sexual orientation and or gender identity. Um, it also can be someone that does not align with uh, societal standards for what sexual orientation or gender identity is. It is not uncommon for people to identify as questioning. As we know, gender and sexual orientation can be fluid and sometimes it is easier for the individual not to identify at all. Intersex, a term used to describe an individual whose chromosome, genitalia, and or secondary sex characteristics may include both male or female. Uh, approximately 3 to 5% of the population are born as intersex. Thankfully today, many intersex individuals get to make the decision as to whether or not they want to have surgery, and they also have the ability to identify for themselves how they would like to identify. An asexual individual is someone that does not experience sexual or physical attraction to other people, but this does not preclude them from experiencing romantic feelings or attachment to other individuals. This is different from celibacy, as celibacy is typically an individual choice not to engage in sexual activity. Assigned sex. So when we, a baby is born, the doctors typically take a look at the anatomy that is present and from that assign an individual as male or female. Um, the term assigned is really used to suggest the social constructionism of sex. As we know today, an individual may be assigned male or female, but that internal sense or psychological sense of self may not match the assigned sex at birth. Gender expression really is a societal construct that assigns maleness or femaleness attributes to personality traits, clothing, colors, career choices, emotions, behaviors, and other societal assignments. When we think of gender expression, we really think about how inanimate objects such as clothing, career choices, personality traits, how in society they have been assigned either to maleness or femaleness when, frankly, there is no maleness or femaleness to those, those constructs. Cissexism refers to gender essentialism. Gender essentialism is the idea that gender binary is the construct. What this leads to is oppression, discrimination towards people that identify as non-binary or individuals that identify as transgender. Heterosexism really is a system of attitudes, bias, and discrimination that supports opposite sex sexuality in relationships. A result of heterosexism may lead to internalized homophobia, lesbophobia, biphobia, transphobia, phobia, feelings of inadequacy, feeling other, feeling invalidated. So there have been many variations of the gender unicorn. The first one was the gender bread, 
followed by the gender bearer. And today we have the gender unicorn. The reason we enjoy and value the gender unicorn because it really promotes the idea of gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, and attraction on a non-binary um, illustration. As you can see in the top row, the gender identity, individuals can identify as female, woman, or girl, or they may identify as male, man, or boy, or they can identify as other genders. Under gender expression, people may identify on the feminine spectrum. Other individuals may identify on the masculine spectrum, and other individuals may identify with both, neither, or all. Sex assigned at birth, we have male, we have female, and we have other intersex individuals. And then we talk about who people are attracted to. Attracted to women, attracted to men, attracted to other genders, and then the emotional attraction to other women, to other men, and to other genders. So this really helps to break out of the binary way of looking and identifying um, the, uh, these spectrums. Pronouns. Pronouns are the number one way that we can honor and validate an individual. We should never make the assumption of someone's uh, pronoun based on their appearance. What we should do is identify ourselves. My name is Todd. I use he, him, his pronouns. And then the other person can reflect back their name and their pronouns that they would like to be referred as. So as it states here, what pronouns do you use are an appropriate question to ask. Our facility and many other facilities we have worked with actually have pronoun buttons that they hand out to, to other clients and staff. Um, and that way um, we know how to identify each other. Another strategy in getting people used to the idea of sharing their pronoun is in daily meetings or if you work with clients in a community setting during community meetings, go around and ask each person to introduce themselves and to share their, their identified pronoun. Again, back to the American Psychological Association standards of care, we talk about stigma, discrimination, and barriers to care. To care. Part of the work that we need to do with the LGBTQ plus community is to really look at how does oppression, stigma, victimization, bullying, and microaggressions affect the health and well-being of LGBTQ individuals. We have to look and help break down institutional barriers uh, to, to care for individuals that identify as part of the queer community. And we need to be advocates to promote social change that reduces the negative effects of stigma on the health and well-being of the queer community. In this day and age, it is a very precarious time for the queer community. Um, based on a lot of the political upheaval going on in the world, um, there is a sense of foreboding and anxiety within the queer identified community. As we will see on our next slide, um, there are significant changes going on within the current um, climate. Individuals that once could serve in the military are now um, at risk of being denied the ability to serve in the military particularly a trans queer identified individuals. On October 8th of this year, there was a hearing, uh, the civil, uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 64, to determine whether or not employers could discriminate against individuals based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Also making headlines is the idea of conversion therapy um, happy to announce that in Minneapolis, Minnesota, conversion therapy has been banned. Part of the, dist the stigma and discrimination leads to individuals being fearful of turning to substances and other unhealthy coping skills to manage their anxiety, their fear, their invalidation, 
for many, many years, the common place to meet other individuals that identified as part of the queer community has historically been bars and clubs. Unfortunately, bars and clubs have not always been a healthy and safe place for individuals to meet. So it is so important in this day and age that we start connecting our LGBTQ individuals to other social outlets and support groups. I know in the Minneapolis area, there are hundreds of organizations that are LGBTQ identified that are social organizations, sports organizations. And so really getting people, getting our community connected to healthy and appropriate supports. Part of today's presentation is going to talk about SAMHSA's 2015 study on sexual orient orientation and estimates of adult substance use and mental health from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. From the study, you see that twice as many LGB individuals have used illicit drugs in the past year. This rate is even higher for our trans queer identified population. According to the U.S. Census Bureau in 2013, a higher percentage of LGBTQ adults ages 18 to 64 had higher rates of binge drinking, also higher risks of psychiatric comorbidities, and higher risks of HIV. At Pride Institute, we see typically co- or tri-comorbidities in substance use, mental health, and a fairly uh, prevalent number of individuals with HIV and other health-related issues. So why specific LGBTQ treatment? Number one, we need to ensure the safety of each and every client that seeks treatment. Um, at Pride Institute, we only serve the LGBTQ community. Um, as part of the work that we do at Pride Institute, we address the sexual orientation, gender identity, minority stress. And the minority stress model posits that people that identify as part of the SOGI minority experienced increased rates of oppression, discrimination, violence, invalidation, microaggressions, bullying due to their identity. It is important also that staff are trained and culturally competent in working with LGBTQ individuals. It is not enough just to say we are culturally sensitive to the needs of the LGBTQ community. There are specific needs and those need to be addressed with the individual. Also, as we know, care to any individual needs to be individualized to the LGBTQ person. Not everyone that seeks treatment at an LGBTQ specific individual has issues with their sexual orientation or gender identity. We also need to be able to address the substance use disorder, mental health, physical health, support system needs, social network needs of the individual. So we're going to get into some of the data and trends that we were seeing within the LGBTQ community. In the state of Minnesota, each client that admits and discharges from a treatment organization in Pride Institute has to fill out the DANES report. This is a drug and alcohol abuse normative evaluation system. And this is a, a uh, inventory that collects demographic data on each client that admits and discharges from treatment, including um, age, race, sexual orientation, gender identity, substance of choice, um, living situation, uh, employment situation. And from that, this is compiled yearly. Unfortunately, it takes about two to three years to get um, uh, reports out to providers. So I wanted to share with you the demographics on a state level, the state of Minnesota, of what we've seen, what we have seen with the LGBTQ community. So from the Danes from 2015, uh, N is 390 for gender. Male was 73%, female almost 27%. Please note, even within the state system, there is not a category for other or for trans queer identified individuals. Again, um, this is a form of institutionalized um, discrimination. Demographics, uh, race was uh, 390, again was the N, white 75%, black 
African American, eight and a half percent. American Indian, three percent. Hispanic, six point five. Asian Pacific Islander, three percent. Point three percent. Other, five point nine percent. Again, when we take a look at the intersectionality of all the identities, um, there's definitely, I believe, accessibility issues for those of uh, other races outside of Caucasian. Age. Uh, Pride Institute does not serve adults, uh, individuals under 18. 18 to 25, we see about 31%. 26 to 34, 32%. 35 and older, 38%. We see substances of choice. At this time in 2015, alcohol was about 36%, followed by methamphetamine. Please note later in this presentation, we're going to talk about the prevalence of methamphetamine use. Um, due to an informal study that I conducted earlier in the year at, on admissions to Pride Institute, methamphetamine has now surpassed alcohol as the number one substance of choice within the community. Uh, moving on, cannabis 7%, heroin 9.3%. Although heroin continues to be an epidemic within the United States, um, it is not the number one primary substance of choice, but due to the lethality of heroin, it is of grave concern to all individuals. And then we look at the discharge status, 78% with staff approval, 10% without staff approval, staff request to judge inappropriate, so probably transferred to another facility. I think this is important to see that about 70, almost 80% of individuals are completing treatment. So if we go from a state level, to Pride Institute. As I mentioned, I conducted uh, research or study on all admissions from Pride Institute from January 1st of this year through September 15th. And these are the substances of choice in order of reported use. Methamphetamine, 97 individuals, primary substance of choice, followed by alcohol. As you can see, opiates, opi opioids at 21%, cocaine, cannabis, hallucinogens, etc. Please note that many individuals that entered treatment had multiple primary substances of choice. Based on assessment, uh, these were given weight and tallied, and this, these are the numbers that are presented based on that. Gender identity from the study from this year, we had 145 male-identified individuals admit to treatment, 41 female-identified. Transgender identified female to male, 10. Trans male to female, 16. And gender queer, non-conforming, eight individuals. So again, what we see at Pride Institute is that a majority and prevalence of male identified Caucasian individuals seeking treatment in the age range between 25 to 38. Sexual orientation, based on the same um, study, Gay, 114, lesbian, 20, bisexual, 47, pan, queer, 26 individuals, heterosexual, 12, two-spirit, one. You may ask why, how, if pride is LGBTQ plus specific, how do heterosexuals admit to pride? Typically, these are in individuals that are identified as trans, male, or female, who identify um, attraction towards the opposite sex as they identify. So again, uh, talking about the 2015 study from SAMHSA, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, um, we're going to look at some of the statistics found from this study. Just want to give you a little overview of the study itself. Um, approximately 68,000 individuals were interviewed in residential uh, neighborhoods throughout the 50 uh, states in the United States, in, in addition to District of Columbia. Out of that, approximately 52,000 adults ages 18 and older were a part of this um, information that will be presented to you currently. As you can see, the red um, is the sexual minority, which is LGB individuals. Sexual majority are those individuals that identify as heterosexual or straight. As we see, and research has supported all along, 
that there are higher incidence and prevalence of substance use within the LGBTQ community due to minority stress. As we see, any illicit drug use is at 39%, cannabis use 30%, misuse of prescription opioids approximately 10%, tranquilizers we're looking at 6%, cocaine 5%, hallucinogens, and so forth. In each of these individual um, labels, we find a higher use of the sexual of sexual minority individuals using substances. Then, if we look at the sexual minority versus the sexual majority of individuals and their age range, we find the following: 32 percent, 18 and older; 18 to 25, 39 percent. 28% for 26 and older, 29% for male, and 34% for female. With it, the lesbian and bisexual female identified population, um, more treatment services are warranted for them. If we look at alcohol use with the sexual minority versus a sexual minority, we will see across the board uh, regarding age range, and at the end, male and female, higher prevalence of use by those within the sexual minority. Again, female rates of alcohol use in the past month are higher than male identified. Again, we see a higher prevalence of use within the sexual minority. We will be speaking further about mental health issues a little bit later in the presentation, but here's an overview of those individuals, 18 and older, that have sought out mental health services who are not part of the SPMI categories. As we can see throughout the age range, sexual minority individuals have sought out um, mental health services at a higher rate than sexual minority. And within the male versus female category, we see fem female also have a higher prevalence of accessing mental health services. Again, this is any mental illness excluding serious mental illness in the past amongst sexual minority and majority adults. We see a higher prevalence in 18 and older, higher prevalence in 18 to 25, 26 older, and amongst male and female, higher rates among female minority individuals. So as part, and as part of the sexual and gender minority stress model, uh, we would be remiss not to look at the adverse childhood experiences of our LGBTQ community. Um, this was a study conducted in 1995 to 1997 by Kaiser Permanente, and they uh, screened over 17,000 individuals from their HMOs. And the adverse childhood experiences inventory really looks from birth through age of 18 the adversity that may have been experienced in a family setting. And typically we see um, these traumas during childhood and adolescence can lead to adverse long-term um, consequences to the individual. And some of the things that we may see are physical health concerns, increased mental health issues, unwanted pregnancies or complications, HIV and other STIs, um, alcohol and drug use, and opportunities for employment or education or even housing. So the screen is very basic. You go through a series of 10 questions. The individual answers yes or no. Again, this is really regarding the upbringing and the home or familial system that the client experienced. Talk about parent or adult that may have insulted, put down, humiliated, or acted in a way that was threatening. Um, was a client ever physically um, abused? Were, was the individual ever experienced inappropriate touch or fondling from someone five years older? Was there any attempt or actual um, engagement in anal or vaginal intercourse? 
Did you not feel special or wanted within the family system? Did you have to go without or never felt like you had enough to eat or had clothing or your parents were too high or drunk to take care of you? Parents separated or divorced, ever hit or abused by a mother or step-parent? Did anyone in the home, be a, were they a problem drinker or alcoholic? Was there a household member that was depressed or mentally ill or committed suicide? And did anyone in the household uh, go to prison? You add up the scores, and based on that, uh, the higher the score, the higher prevalence for uh, possible uh, consequences um, to um, poor health. So I did an informal study of the adverse childhood experiences of the Pride clients uh, over the past year. Our N was 136. We found the median score to be 4.68, so almost five yes answers to the adverse experiences. This is a breakdown of the number of clients that answered, answered yes to the question. You will see questions eight, nine, and 10 um, receive the highest answers. Some would go to prison, some would commit suicide or have mental health issues, with problem drinking or substance use in the home. So based on the ACE results, we all understand and know that childhood trauma can change our body and brain chemistry. You add to this an individual that identifies as LGBTQ and experiences stress, discrimination, victimization, bullying, microaggressions. You add the two together, and we're looking at individuals that possibly may look for ways to cope with the multiple traumas that they have experienced. So it, it to me, makes sense that this community, our queer community, have higher rates of substance use, mental health issues, and perhaps other unhealthy coping skills due to past traumas and due to most likely current trauma that they're experiencing due to their LGBTQ identity. So the next portion of this uh, presentation, we'll move into assessment of the uh, queer population. I need to acknowledge our medical director and staff psychiatrist, Dr. Patrick Chow, as he is the author and creator of the LGBTQ plus affirming comprehensive psychiatric consultation. Due to his research and his work with LGBTQ individuals, he has created an assessment or evaluation that is based on sexual orientation, gender identity, a consultation specifically for the queer community. A quick review of the 2017 Gallup survey found 4.5% of adult Americans identified as part of the queer community, approximately 5% of women compared with 4% of men, 0.06% of adults identify as trans or queer population. Some of the growth within the LGBTQ community is attributed to millennials and Generation Z and the comfort they have in shattering gender binary uh, dictates. So when we look at the SAMHSA study, we want to look at three different things. When SAMHSA did their, their study, they looked at sexual attraction, sexual identity, and sexual behaviors. And what they had found is the sexual majority, which is 94%, are individuals that identify as heterosexual or straight. Any sexual minority, which may be lesbian, gay, bisexual, is approximately 4.3%. Others are unknown, which may be individuals that are questioning or fluid or chose not to answer, is 1.7. Again, when we review the number of individuals that have accessed mental health services in the past year, we look at the sexual minority and we see that across the board, individuals as part of the minority have sought out mental health services with females within the sexual minority accessing services at a higher rate. Again, review of the sexual minority and illicit substance use across the board. The sexual minority has a higher prevalence of use, 
with higher rates within the female uh, lesbian population or bisexual female population. Again, review of illicit drug use, and we go down throughout the different categories of the substances. We find the sexual minority has a higher substance or prevalence use of substances. So what we find that within the LGBTQ community, and even though it's less than 5% of the population, that sexual and gender minority have the ability to move people toward the use of substances, mental health issues, and other health issues to cope and to manage the discrimination, oppression, victimization, bullying, and microaggressions they may experience due to their minority status. Okay, so if we use the minority stress theory to look at and using that as a foundation or the framework for understanding sexual minority mental health disparities, we will gain understanding of how to work with uh, individuals that identify as part of the LGBTQ community. Again, a review that due to the minority identification, either gender or sexual orientation, people are at exposure of stigma, victimization, prejudice, and discrimination. In addition, for individuals that have substance use disorder, mental health issues, or other co-occurring disorders, this also added, adds an additional layer of stigma to that individual. And so this really supports the need to treat the entire individual, ensuring that we are addressing all the intersectionalities of the individual's identity. A quote from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender are questioning often face social stigma, discrimination, and other challenges not encountered by people who identify as heterosexual. They also face a greater risk of harassment and violence. As a result of these and other stressors, sexual minorities are at increased risk for various behavioral health issues. Research supports that specialized treatment for individuals lead to better outcomes. Only 7.5% of programs offer specialized services for LGBTQ individuals. And it is vitally important that not only SUD disorders are screened, but also other psychiatric comorbidities. When looking at treatment of the queer community, we see a higher higher prevalence of mental health and substance use disorder issues, a higher health care burden and cost, higher other co-occurring conditions, and lower accessibility to competent care. The SGM Center Psychiatric Assessment is based on research conducted by Patrick Chow. Um, due to a paucity of literature on working with the LGBTQ community, there's a lack of standard and guidelines. Please note that a regular psychiatric consultation or assessment is not the same as an LGBTQ specific or LGBTQ centered assessment. So the three components include the SOGI screening, the SOGI development and the process of development and the stigma and the um, issues related to the minority status and growing up as a part of the minority status. So the screening piece includes the name, the gender identification, gender expression, how they identify as far as their sexual orientation, transitional status, and spirituality. Please note transition status, we will talk to you in a f about, uh, refer to in a few minutes. We are talking about social, hormonal, and or surgical or medical transitional status. Spirituality is highlighted here. As you know, spirituality can be a protective factor and for many individuals can be a, a form of support. The development piece is the client's own awareness of their sexual gender minority status and identification, what that process was like for them growing up, what their coming out process was for them, and currently how they view themselves and their SOGI development. 
for many individuals, some of the work that needs to be done is individuals take the negative messages from society, educational institutions, religious institutions, familial systems. They internalize that, which leads to shame and also the concept of internalized homonegativity, bi-negativity, trans, queer negativity, in which the individual takes those negative messages, internalizes them, and feels a deep sense of shame and validation and, and, and feeling unworthy. Again, so we look at the, their coming out history. What was their culture and spirituality like throughout uh, their uh, developmental process? geographical and political factors in their upbringing. Again, back to that internalized homophobia, internalized fear of being a part of the minority status. Sexual health issues, which uh, covers a, a gamut of issues, and access or institutional barriers to access to health care and systems. Particularly for the non-cisgender client or the gender minority, we've seen a rapid growth in this population seeking treatment over the past three years. It's a very diverse and heterogeneous population. Uh, as many of you are aware, over the past years, gender identity disorder has been changed to gender, dys gender dysphoria with the, within the DSM-5. Gender dysphoria really should be seen as more of a longitudinal um, issue that typically there's not a beginning and end to it, and it may be experienced throughout a lifetime, and it is unique to each individual. There are transition, transition issues. Please, please note the goal of all individuals is not always to transition. And from Dr. Patrick Chow's work that he has done and, and another independent study, he has, find, has found a higher overlap rate of autism spectrum disorder, and sensory integration issues within the gender nonconforming clients that he has worked with. I'm going to shorten this up. Let's go back to gender dysphoria and DSM-5. DSM dysphoria and the DSM-5, really looking at gender dysphoria, the history of it, how it presents itself today, and the work that needs to be done to address gender dysphoria. So we look at the transition of gender minority. There's three stages of transition. There's a social transition, which includes coming out to family and friends, may include legal change of names and identification through the court systems, if allowed within the state. There's the hormonal transition, which may include the use of hormones, estradiol or spironolactone for individuals from male to female, and testosterone for female to male. And there is a concept of surgical transition, uh, which may include gender reassignment surgeries. What we typically see at Pride Institute or most clients are in the social or hormonal transition stage. And again, not all gender queer or trans identified individuals are interested in doing anything beyond a social transition. The evaluation itself is semi-structured. Dr. Chow takes approximately two hours for each individual, which is oftentimes unheard of in a treatment setting. He goes through the screening, the development. He assesses the stigma and minority stress as far as the impact of that on the individual. He has been conducting these evaluations since 2017 with approximately 500 individuals and counting. Um, again, it is a specific set of questions for sexual orientation, gender identity screening, includes the gender dysphoria history, the transitional history and sta status, a standard screening for the autism spectrum disorder um, scale. And Dr. Chow presented one case study that we'll quickly go through. He, in 2016, prior to the use of his affirming psychiatric evaluation, saw an individual with severe alcoholism that interfered with their personal and professional life and warranted being on medication-assisted therapy. Depression, although atypical, responded to current treatment. Inattention symptoms uh, needs to be carefully ruled out of a neurocognitive disorder from possible alcohol use. In 2019, this individual readmitted to Pride Institute uh, after relapse. This was a client's third admission. 
uh, reports frequent relapses and unsuccessful SU treatment as manifold. Aside from compliance issues with naltrexone or medication-assisted therapy, due to this consult and assessment, really tapped into the client's sense of internalized homophobia, their alienation from their family members, and growing up in a conservative community, all which played into the client's sense of shame and um, feeling unworthy. And really, the client had taken those negative messages from family members, society, institutional organizations, and internalized them. Due to the assessment and the uncovering of these issues, the client was recommended to move into sober housing, actually a sober house that was LGBTQ identified, to attend an exclusive intensive outpatient program. The client continued on naltrexone and continued to affect her for his mood. And based on that, uh, though that assessment allowed us to see that we need to work closely with the client's minority stress um, that they experienced that uh, eventually would lead them back to relapse. And so during this course of treatment, we were able to provide and to address that issue. Key points, LGBTQ-centered care is vital and inseparable. The comprehensive assessment includes screening, SG development assessment, and the evaluation of the SG minority-related stress. There's a cross-training of autism, ASD, and sensory issues with gender minority clients. A quote, we will declare frankly that nothing is clear in this world, only fools and charlatans know and understand everything. And as we continue work in the LGBTQ field, field, as we know, more will be revealed. Thank you so much for joining today. This concludes the presentation. We will now move into the question and answer session. So our first question is, how do you room clients in residential services that identify as queer and or transgender? That is a outstanding question, and there is no easy, simplified answer to it. And yet, it can be very simple. The first thing you'll want to do is to make sure your policies and procedures support individuals that identify as part of the trans, queer, identified community. Typically, at Pride Institute, all of our clients room according to their reported or their identified gender identity. And so if someone identifies as trans female or queer female, they would be roomed with other um, female identified individuals. The same if someone is a trans male or trans queer identified, they would, they would be housed or roomed with another uh, male identified individuals. Um, typically what we find is at Pride Institute, we don't really encounter any issues with this as long as and, and the groundwork has been laid, that we, inf we make sure that this is part of the dialogue with clients seeking treatment, that they understand that we serve clients of all gender and sexual orientation identities, and our policies and procedures support how we room individuals in our treatment setting. I know there are questions around, well, what about if someone has a sense, uh, history of trauma, or what if they're fearful? We have not had any issues with that particularly. What we do find sometimes that there are more personality issues between some of the individuals. And so what we find is if there's a conflict within the room assignments and the two clients or three clients cannot work out the issue, one of the clients will be housed to an, or moved to another room. If an individual has an issue with a trans queer to identified individual that's placed in the room, the individual that has the issue will be moved to another room as we are supportive, inclusive, and affirming of all gender identities. The second question is why is there such a high prevalence of methamphetamine use in certain subsets of the LGBTQ population? Another really good question. As you may have remembered from the presentation, for Pride Institute, as far as up until September 2019, for the year of 2019, methamphetamine has, use has outnumbered the use of alcohol for the first time in many years. What we're finding is that um, there are a couple of factors that weigh into um, methamphetamine use. Number one, um, methamphetamine 
has a really high um, prevalence in particularly the gay and bisexual men who engage in, uh, how do I want to say this, um, sexually compulsive or uh, sexually excessive behaviors. What we have found is that for many individuals, once they make that link with methamphetamine to sexual behaviors, um, the combination of the two can result in an experience and a release of neurotransmitters that cannot be experienced uh, without the use of substances, which can make it hard for treatment because it's hard to replicate that experience without the use of methamphetamine. Not that it can't be done, but it's such a powerful um, enforcer or reward system that it can lead to, uh, lead to relapse. So what typically happens with methamphetamine use, it allows for people to break down inhibitions. It provides a boost in uh, temporary self-esteem or confidence. It may allow individuals to engage in certain sexual behaviors that normally they aren't comfortable engaging in when they're sober. So when they start using methamphetamine and then they connect methamphetamine with sexual activity, and we will find, you know, Media, uh, social media apps and other sites that are easy accessible, easily accessible where people can hook up with other individuals that use methamphetamine. It really creates a storm and difficulty when treating the individual because it also includes having to untease the link that uh, begins between the methamphetamine use and the sexual behaviors. Third question is, what is the impact of growing up in a heteronormative society on the LGBTQ mental health and substance use? I think that was pretty apparent uh, through uh, the SAMHSA study of 2015 and the work that we do at Pride Institute. Those individuals that are part of the minority sexual orientation gender identity community experienced increased rates of oppression discrimination, violence, prejudice, bullying, and microaggressions. And basically, um, if you don't identify as part of the heteronormative society, you feel like other, like your, your identity, your way you present in life, show up in life, are not as valid as the majority or the heteronormative society. Because of that and, uh, and the oppression and discrimination, people often turn to unhealthy coping mechanisms, including substance use, uh, higher rates of mental health issues, and other unhealthy behaviors. When you take all of that into account, it, it really speaks to the need to ensure that we are addressing the entire client as a whole. That is all the time we have for questions. Thank you so much. Have an outstanding day. Thank you.